All right. My computer shows us at the top of the hour. So we're going to kick this meeting off, registration protocols extensions. I am Jim Galvin, my co-chair Antoine Bichurin is right here with us. And this is uh, the regex meeting. So if you're not in the right room, this would be a good time to find a better place to be. We have a very full agenda today. Um, if you were counting carefully, we have 93 minutes on our agenda and there's only a 90 minute meeting. So we're going to be very strict about asking people to move along uh, and uh, try to stick to our times here so that we can get to everything that we'd like to get to. Um, okay, with that in mind, uh, this is a note well, since we are now Thursday afternoon in the penultimate session for the day. I'm sure you've all seen this uh, quite a lot, um, so I won't spend too much time here. But, you know, generally, if you're here at the IETF and you're contributing in any way, that includes speaking at the mic, um, it, you know, becomes part of the public record and, and part of uh, what is um, uh, essentially, um, you know, that the, the property or uh, um, I hate to use the word property, but anyway, it, it's, a, it's a part of the ITF process. And this is a new slide in our meeting here, which I shamelessly uh, scarfed from the dispatch meeting because I liked it a lot. Um, as I looked at it, this is just a reminder that, you know, we are all expected to be well behaved. And this is an indication of, you know, being well behaved means in part that if you feel like you haven't been treated well, we have an ombuds team who is ready uh, and present and, and available to help you through that process and help you deal with that. And of course, what I really like about this slide is a reminder to all of us that you should uh, take the time to be helpful to your fellow attendee. So um, if you have issues, if you see something happening, you know, um, you can either, you know, try to uh, be a part of that or certainly talk to the ombuds team yourself and express that something was happening and, and they will help you in, in figuring out how to be more helpful in the future to deal with that. And then, of course, we have our IETF Code of Conduct guidelines. Um, you know, a reminder, we're here for technical discussions. Let's keep our discussions at a technical level. And we're also here as individuals, please always be talking in terms of best engineering judgment for the internet. And uh, you know, if you're gonna be here, please do contribute to the work. Uh, even if you're not writing the documents, reviewing documents is a big deal. Paying attention to what they say is a big deal. So you know, please do take the time to do that and indicate that you've done it on the mailing list when we ask for that, okay? So, um, this is agenda bassing. We've kind of gone through the welcome and introductions already, but uh, this has been posted uh, earlier this week. Any questions or comments? Anyone want to adjust our agenda? Pretty pro forma. This is pretty much what it always is at every meeting. We just walk through things. So moving right along, since we're committed to that, we'll get to the published slide here. Oh, I should say probably briefly about the welcome and introductions. Um, you know, we don't, the, though the note scribe is on here, just a reminder, we have been for uh, over a year now, we just submit the transcript as our minutes. Uh, we try to give it a, a quick read through to make sure that it has been transcribed reasonably well, but that's our minutes. So we're not looking for a note scribe in particular. Oh, well, thank you, Rick Wellhelm. So excellent. Uh, appreciate that. Um, it normally is pre-filled with our agenda, and that's great. And Rick's going to add some summary points in there as we go along. So thank you for that, Rick. And on the document management side, just a reminder, you know, we do look for a document shepherd for every document when, when a new work item is absorbed. And document shepherds do have a pretty significant responsibility, uh, especially as we go through working group last call, um, in making sure that all comments are addressed and covered and they're supposed to help the document through the ISG process when that becomes an issue. If there's any questions there. Okay, quickly moving to published documents. Sadly, once again, none this time, but next time, hopefully we'll have quite a few um, because as we look at the submitted to the ISG, we have four documents that are out there, which are all actively uh, work in progress. Uh, these things are moving along. In fact, I have a couple of real-time updates for you. The open ID document, is uh, the revised AD has a uh, revised ID, okay, has actually already been published, okay, and uh, Murray has already pushed that forward to the RFC editor. So it's now not in AD follow-up, it's in the RFC editor queue. So that's a good thing. I'm sure that'll move along smartly. 
And the redacted document, it says here it was rating for revised ID because that was the state when I made the slides. But in fact, that has been published uh, just yesterday, in fact. So that's a very real-time update. Um, and uh, we'll otherwise keep skipping along here. And we'll get to existing work. And I will now turn that over to Coach Aaron. Yes. So, Gavin, I will load your slides. Stop slides. And let's see. TTL one. TTL one, right? This one. Okay, uh, hello everyone. This is Gavin Brown. Um, I am just going to give you a quick update on the uh, TTL extension. So if we can move on to the next slide. For those who aren't familiar with it, who haven't been following this, is an uh, EPP extension to allow registrars to specify the TTL values on records that live in the parent zone, so NS records, DS records, and so on. Um, it's been in the working group as a document uh, since May, but has a long history before then. Uh, there is some interest in getting this uh, finalized and deployed, so I'm trying to move fairly quickly to hit the, the May 24 deadline for, for ISG, ISG submission. Um, the current draft was submitted in September, and I posted to the mailing list that it's very much a straw man because I didn't particularly like the XML syntax that it uses. If you could move on to the next slide. <clears throat> um, it, it, it is kind of, the objective was to try and minimize the amount of business logic required to implement this extension in a server by making the schema do all of the work of validating what comes from the client. Um, but it does so by putting DNS record types into the schema as element names. And this felt like a leaky abstraction. It didn't feel very nice. Um, and when I took it to uh, the uh, various technical groups, uh, the ICANN meeting in Hamburg a couple of weeks ago, that was the, the kind of uh, feedback I got was this is, this is not very nice and no one particularly likes it. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, so I'm making one final push to try and get some feedback on this today. Um, but I have a proposal to go forward and I want to circulate that as, a, as an alternative to the current syntax. So if we can move on to the next slide. So firstly, I'm going to start simplifying things because there needs to be a trade-off. If we're going to make implementation on the server a bit harder, we need to simplify other things so that it balances out. So the, the old um, specification had a kind of global TTL was, you could just set a TTL across everything, and then uh, you could either choose that or a more specific explicit TTL where you could specify individual record types. That's going away. They're just going to be one format, which is um, uh, where you have multiple TTL elements and you specify the record type as an attribute to the, um, to the element. Um, and then we have to have normative language in the spec itself to stop things like having two elements with the same NS type or having um, a quad A um, records for domains um, where, where it's not appropriate if they're not, if they're not using the host attribute model, that sort of thing. Um, and we're, I'm also going to remove the, 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 the cascading effect of um, uh, TTLs for A and quad A records set on the domain name cascading down onto the parent because that again, made things more complicated on the, on, the, um, on the server side. So the ultimate outcome of that is going to be um, that a, a, if you can move on to the next slide, um, is that a, a create command, for example, is going to look like this. So um, if you're creating a domain name and it's um, going to have DS records, it's going to have NS records, then you use the extension to specify the TTL for those two record types. and. Um, potentially also a DNAME record if there are aliases. And then uh, if you move on to the next slide, this is what the host create record looks like. So only specifying a quad A in the extension element. Um, next slide, please. So this is uh, um, for a domain create with host attributes. So obviously if you're not using host objects, then you need, still need a way to specify um, the TTL for glue records in that scenario because you can't apply them directly to a host object because there isn't one. So this is an example of a domain create element where you're specifying an A record. And then next slide, please. So the XML syntax is simpler. The schema is smaller. 
Um, but there is uh, effort required to validate the input that wasn't required previously with a balancing effect that the, the rest of the schema or the rest of the, rest of the extension is simpler to implement. It was about striking a balance. And what I'm looking for is any feedback on whether or not this is the right balance to be struck, whether the, we need to move in other ways, or whether there's something I'm missing about XML schema that allows us to, to put more work on the schema to do the validation. So that's, that's it really. Um, uh, so I know I'm, I'm listening if you have questions now um, or later, um, we'd be keen to hear them. But uh, I think I'm probably going to move forward with the, um, the new syntax and publish that next week. So thank you, Gavin. Any questions for Gavin? Somebody in the queue? I don't see anybody in the queue. I have a question, Gavin. Did you, you, you said you looked for, um, uh, for people that in, in ICANN to see what is like. Did you collaborate with, for example, DNS, the DNS Ops Working Group because this is about DNS records? So I haven't taken it to uh, any of the DNS working groups or communities yet. Um, primarily working in the uh, tech ops, CPH Tech Ops at ICANN and um, the CCNSO Tech Day. Okay. Um, but uh, I, you know, taking this to the DNS world is is, is something I think is in, it would be good to get feedback on. Um, I haven't gone to those groups, but I. Yeah, we, we, we can also still do that just yeah. before publication, right, to yeah. give them a thorough look through if, they're, yeah. if they see any issues. But, yeah. yeah. So if there are no more questions, then thank you, Gavin. Oh, um, no, we've got a hand up. Uh, in the queue. I don't see anybody in the queue. <laughs> <laughs> Jim? Ah, you have it. Uh, where, where, do you, where do you get it? Look up on the screen. Also behind you, but it, it's here. Uh, it's not here. Okay, then you do the queue. <laughs> okay, so Pal will come up. Yeah, please. Um, so uh, um, there was discussion on the mailing list about uh, the NS record and whether it's uh, optional or mandatory. Uh, I didn't see any comment on this on the slides. Can you? Can you? Yeah. Comment? So so in the next version that I'm due to publish, the, the NS is is going to be optional. Okay, next one, Scott. Thank you, Scott Hollenbeck. Uh, Gavin, this is very similar to what we did in the base spec to identify IP addresses. There's an attribute that identifies the type. So I'm a fan. I think this is a good idea. Thank you. Jim. Jim Reed. Um, as far as the DNSSEC review is concerned, I'll make a shameless plug for the DNS directorate. And so I could ask the co-chairs to chuck this document at some point over the wall to the directorate and have someone on that review the document for you. It probably doesn't need to go to the DNS working group, but if you want to do that, you can do that too. Okay, thank you. That, that was actually my proposal, Jim. Okay, thank you. Gavin. Then next one up is tom harrison about the rar search so let me get your slides up tom i think these are there so go ahead okay good. thanks uh next slide Right. Okay. So this has been presented uh, a few times now. It's a document about extending search in RDAP for the internet number resource types, so IPs, ASNs, and reverse domains. The first part is search by handle and name uh, for IPs and ASNs. The second part is about less specific and more specific searches. And the third part is about extending reverse search for IPs and ASNs. Uh, the aim with this is that we get, by implementing this, we get feature parity between who is an RDAP. That helps with shifting people off who is and onto RDAP and potentially with deprecating uh, who is in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, there have been a few changes since the last meeting. As part of the changes for version two, we expanded the document to support searches for arbitrary ranges rather than just having link relations uh, in existing objects. But we didn't expand the examples at the same time. Uh, and that meant that the behavior 
for arbitrary ranges wasn't really that clear. So as part of version three, there are many more examples with arbitrary ranges and hopefully that will help to make the behavior clearer, uh, particularly around the bottom type search. There's been a bit of tightening of the text around status parameters, uh, various editorial changes. One thing that we flagged at the last meeting was this idea of having the links be omitted by the server if there were no objects to be returned for a specific type of search. We didn't get any feedback on that, so we'll go with a more cautious approach, which is that there's nothing mandated in that respect, and then that means that there's less chance of implementation problems on the server side leading to a client drawing incorrect inferences about the state of the data. Uh, next slide, please. There's really one open issue here, which is the fact that the extension identifier is not used in some of the path segments. Uh, we had some feedback from Jim Gould on the list in favor of a more standards compliant approach. Uh, after discussing this among the RIRs, the consensus was in favor of the current text. And also on that, on that point, there's this unadopted extensions document, which notes that the intention with a lot of these restrictions was not to constrain RFC extension authors, but more about non-RFC extension authors who, who might not have got the same level of review as an RFC would have got. So we're looking for more input from the working group on this. Uh, and if the consensus is in favor of the more standards compliant approach, then we'll register some the additional identifiers that we need uh, in order to address this problem. Next slide, please. But after that, we think this is ready for working group last call. But if anybody has any other changes they want to see or anything like that, uh, please let us know. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Tom. I now found the queue in my uh, in my chair version of the uh, Meet Echo, so I don't see anybody in the queue as of yet. Any questions to Tom? Just raise your hand. <laughs> I've been in queue. Thank you. Um, Rick Wilhelm, PIR. Um, I didn't quite understand the bit. I didn't quite, uh, Rick Wilhelm, PIR. Um, I didn't quite understand the bit about the extension identifiers that it sounded like uh, Gould suggested use more standards compliant ide extension identifiers. And then we basic, you're basically saying, no, we're not going to because we asked people who don't participate in standards bodies and they said they didn't want standards compliant identifiers. Or did I mishear that? Because that, that sounds like we, we asked children if they, if they would want to eat their vegetables and the children said, no, we like candy. So we said, okay, we won't make them eat vegetables. And it seems to me like we, we should want in this room to be the adults and keep things more standards compliant. That might sound a little more glib than I wanted it to. I say it with a smile on my face, but it seems like here we should be trying, at, while, the, while we have a chance, we should be trying to make these things more standards compliant if we can. But maybe I misunderstood the way that, the way that was going. Thanks. This is good working group input, so yeah. Um, yep. Uh, if the if the consensus is that direction, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Andy. Yeah, Andy. Um, so the the point was that this the what what uh, Tom is talking about is the extension identifier in this case is being used to stop name collisions, and the point of things going through the IETF is we know when we are colliding with things we're already doing, whereas people who put the extensions into RDAP who don't go through the IETF don't know that. So, and that was, that's the point that I believe Tom was trying to make and also the point of that extensions draft. Okay, James Gould. Uh, Jim Gould, Verisign. I honestly don't remember my feedback. Did, did you actually have an example or something that could refresh my memory? That'd be appreciated. Need to go back to one slide. Or... Uh, which part do you mean, though? Like, which what? Okay, uh, sure. Maybe, maybe All right, sure. Um, 
I don't remember all of the options, uh, mainly because the just registering the additional IPs and ORT nums identifiers seemed like the simplest way of addressing the problem. And at least with the RIRs, that was that was where we were heading if we had to address this. So. Okay, let's let's solve this on the mailing list, right? Thanks. Okay, and thank you, John. And then we move on to the next presentation or presentation. Actually, I think we have now gone to the context discussion, right? Where are we? We need a lot of slides here. So first we have Andy uh, presenting uh, his uh, simple contact. So I actually put up the wrong slide, sorry for that. So go ahead, Jim. Yeah, next slide. So uh, I, this is mostly a presentation of what's changed since um, 117. Uh, and the output of that working group session at 117 was make it simpler. Uh, it's simple, but not simple enough. So uh, that's what we did. Uh, the postal info is now mostly unstructured, uh, but we did pull out some common elements, mostly that you would find in 5733, uh, and allow them to be explicitly stated, but you still have an unstructured postal code. Um, the, uh, and uh, this is actually a little bit, a little bit behind, uh, because I had a meeting with uh, Dan and Jim earlier today, and there's some even more things we can do to get this to line up with 5733. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, the draft calls out being able to uh, link to V cards or J cards or, or JS contact or in the future C board contact or whatever. So next slide. Um, we, we removed the mast thing that was duplicative. Uh, that's now covered by redacted, uh, which is going to RFC. Uh, the uh, email addresses are now uh, compatible with SMTP UTF-8, uh, and we added some guidance on how you deal with nested entities. Next slide. Um, yeah, Pavel, who I'm, I wish he was here, I was going to discuss this with him, has suggested that uh, for more EPP alignment, uh, we use the, we actually move away from arrays and use loc and int uh, uh, objects or properties in an object. Um, I'm, I'm looking a little bit for some feedback on this. My uh, inclination at the moment is to keep it as arrays because it's a little more extensible, I guess. Uh, and since they are in preference order, you can figure out which one you need. Um, and then also to change some of the property names to match the EPP uh, contact as well. Next slide. Uh, in the draft, we also have a proposal on how to move forward with uh, contacts. Since simple contact is meant to handle the case for 99% you know, of all uh, registries uh, are able to represent their data using simple contact. Um, for the cases where you might have a, uh, something that, can, that can't be uh, presented that way, uh, to actually use the, currently, the current built-in, and this is not a, a simple contact thing, this is base art app, just use a link, uh, link structure to link to a file or something uh, that might have vCard, because currently, currently we can't support vCard, and that is actually the most prevalent contact uh, uh, um, format out there today. Uh, but you could do it to JCard, you could do it to JS contact. And if in the future someone says that CWAR contact is a, a thing we got to do or whatnot, you could do it with that as well. Next slide. And here's what that looks like. It's just another, another link structure uh, where you just, uh, you would uh, throw it into the current links that are already there. So it's nothing, nothing uh, out of the world. Next slide. I think this was it. Oh, that's it's it. The last slide. Okay, and then stay a little bit because we have a specific question from Paul. Yeah. Paul, go ahead. Uh, Paul Kvalbenik. Uh, so, um, in talking about uh, arrays um, usage in the, in the simple contact, yeah. So that I think one of the augmentation was uh, because of reduction. So that that. Uh, Reduction is complicated if uh, arrays are, are new. And uh, um, the the second thing was was about uh, 
basically differentiator between the array elements. Yeah, so so whether it's only uh, this language or locality, uh, or we foresee multitude of of uh, address data which are kind of having different differentiators. So uh, with the languages, what you will see sometimes, not not in a lot of places is uh, uh, information given to you in like the language of the, the where the registry is. Uh, and then maybe sometimes it's an internationalized version. Uh, so an example might be you get a, a, an address in Japan that's in the, the Japanese one line style. Uh, and then they Englishify it. And, and it's the two line things that has English words in it. Um, I don't know. I've never seen an example where someone does it in more than two languages. So uh, in, in essence, you could, you could just say you can only support two. Um, my whole, whole reason of keeping it as an array is you could support more. And, and it's just a, uh, you know that the arrays are in preference order anyway. So uh, hopefully that, that addresses your question. Mm, well, it addresses the part of the question. The reduction problem remains in the sense, right? Can you explain what you mean by the reduction problem? The reduction problem is that basically once you reduct one array element as a whole, basically the whole order of things shifts and the, the indexes are not in the same place anymore. Oh, that's a good point. All right. Uh, yeah, let's let, let me I'll, I'll talk to you about that. But that's a, that's a very good point. All right. Did, did that address your question? Yes. yes. All right. Yep. And then we have a small question. I hope a fast question because we're running out of time. Christian, go ahead. Yeah, Kristen Zim, also Danik. Um, just a short clarification question. Um, when uh, regarding the RDAP links, do you suggest a server to implement all of these or just some? And how do you address um, like a client expecting some different format? Well, so the links has a MIME type in there, or media type. It used to be called MIME type. Uh, has a meme, uh, media type, which is a mandatory uh, element of the link structure. So that's how the client knows whether it can, it, whether it needs it or not, or can understand it. Uh, there's nothing in there about what's mandatory. So there's no, I, we can't mandate people put things into vCard format if it's not if they're not willing to do it. So it's it's completely optional. Okay, thank you. And then we have another question, uh, Werner. from core association are any provisions possible or in the future possible for putting company identifiers for organizations as opposed to just a name that is already in base rdap as a public uh, i think it's called public ids and that's an array already that's that's not part of the contact model it's outside of the contact yes okay. yeah that's got that's that, that's besides the, the contact thing All right before I, I try to sit down again yes okay <laughs> So thank you, Andy. Um, then we have a um, we have a discussion about contacts in general and all the proposals on the table. So I, uh, Jim's going to do the, to lead that uh, discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, so no, leave it on the previous slide for a moment. Yeah. Um, so I sent a note to the mailing list about this. Uh, this is kind of a it, it really is an important question for the working group. Um, we really do have to make a decision as a group here about the status that we want these various uh, documents and uh, contact proposals uh, to have uh, going into uh, publication. So we have uh, in EPP, as we know, we, we have a contact mapping that's been well-defined and is essentially the standard for contact objects, if you will, and, and what they're going to look like. And that has an XML encoding for contact objects. That is the essence of our deployed base. Um, we now have an RDAP standard, which actually proposes using JSON for uh, encoding uh, contact objects. And we have this addition here that we took on as a working group item using JS contact in RDAP which actually is a slightly different definition of a contact object because it's based off of JCARD out of the Calex work. So not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but it is simply an alternative. It's, it's simply another definition of a contact object. And now we've just listened to Andy remind us the document in that case is not a document which is currently in front of the working group. 
Um, the presumption here is that he'll be asking for the working group to adopt it. But then that becomes a question to us about if we adopt it, what is the what do we want to do with that document in terms of the status that we want it to have? Right now, the JS contact in our DAP document uh, really has uh, two features. One is, of course, it's a it's a new encoding for the responses. It uses uh, JSON in, instead of XML, that which is what EPP is based on. Um, but more importantly, it also includes a mechanism for RDAP clients and RDAP servers uh, to uh, negotiate, if you will, and, and confirm with each other uh, whether they're using uh, JS Contact or they're um, they're they're using JS Contact um, uh, if, if that's what they want to use in in the response um, or if they want to use uh, the JSON. Uh, normal standard response in RDAP as defined there. So you have a way to do all of that. And it is currently targeted to be on the standards track. That's the way we've been thinking about it. Um, and that seemed like a reasonable thing to do um, given un until we had this third option here, uh, which has come up with simple contact. So next slide, please. So the important question for this working group is what would we like to do given that we are now in the process of suggesting that there's um, essentially more than one definition of what's a, what's a contact object. Um, so we, we have, as we said, one widely deployed standard. We have the JSON proposal and we have this new suggestion uh, for a simplified contact object, uh, which has you know, a, a lot of uh, appeal uh, in terms of it, it, its value in, in registration systems. So, do we still think that you know this new simplified contact uh, under the presumption that it's going to be asked to be adopted by the working group should it with js contact should they both be on the standard track is that an appropriate place for them to go given that we already have you know the single standard definition of a, a contact object in the way that it's used in our in our systems this is an important question not just in general but also because in our charter, our charter actually says that we in general want to seek to have one standard. One of the reasons for evaluating extensions and having extensions on the standard track is a presumption that if there is more than one which looks similar, we will seek to bring them together. So rather than having more than one, the idea is to, to push ourselves, the industry at large, the technology in the direction of having a, a, a single one. So that's where we get this interesting, important first sub-question there about, is there a compelling reason to change the existing standard? Is there a compelling reason that either simplified contact or JS contact should actually be on the standard track, which would suggest that we're seeking to change the already singular deployed standard for what looks like a contact object. And we're looking for some discussion about this question. You know, do you have a reason that you want to bring forward that suggests that they're, this, we should put them on the standard track and thus signal, if you will, uh, at a minimum, that we're going to seek to change that at some point in the future? Because the truth is, from an IETF point of view, and also drawing on what our charter currently says, absent any compelling reason to actually signal or suggest we're going in that direction, Experimental or informational would be a preferred direction and a preferred path for these documents. Um, you know, that is just the way things are ordinarily done and the way we would expect them to be. Um, and then, of course, if we're going to, if we decide to go down this path of suggesting that there should be more than one, uh, we just put the general question out there that for the moment we're focused on RDAP. And, and the fact that we're suggesting two different things for RDAP or potentially three different things, but it does beg the question. It allows us to at least ask ourselves the question, gee, do we wanna to try to bring this kind of model uh, forward um, uh, into uh, EPP? You know, I mean, if we're gonna to seek to change things, is that something that we should seek to change uh, in EPP and find a way to allow the option of using one of these other contact definitions um, in EPP. Um, and so, you know, that's the question and the issue that we need to have before us. So this is discuss. This is the opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say about that. And 
wow, I see we have quite a queue. So now I'm done talking. So we'll just manage the queue here at this point. So Powell, you're up first. Yes, thank you. Uh, Powell Kowali, Dinik. Uh, so uh, I start with qu clarifying question to the chairs uh, for, the, for this slide, because you are mentioning uh, the RFC 5733, which is a EPP uh, uh, model. Uh, but are you uh, referring to the um, to it in terms of RDAP like a data model because the representation is obviously different because here's XML, here is, is JSON. So I, I don't think it's appropriate to ask whether we should put XML inside JSON uh, response of the RDAP. Yeah, so that this, this will be the first question. Yeah, it's just, just about the data. From my point of view, it's just about the data mile, but that's a fair question to put before the group, you know, yeah. if we want to change something. Yeah, so, so, so continuing on this, uh, I think, uh, this was part of the discussion of what uh, Andy presented as well uh, in simple context. So um, one of the arguments was uh, whether it does set, make sense to uh, navigate simple contact in the direction of uh, RFC 5733 data model. So basically they align. I, at least in my opinion, it makes a lot of sense to do that unless we, we as a group uh, here uh, see some deficits in RFC 5733 and we think about uh, changing it, but then we should change it both ways, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. George, you're next. George Michelson, AP Nick. I have drifted across views of this problem space over a long period of time. I was originally a maximalist and thought we should describe every unique atom of representation of some aspect of an address and a name. If it was a distinct quality, then we should normalize it to the furthest extent and know about them in micro detail. And I argued for this vociferously. And people like Mario came back saying, this is just not realistic or practical. We need to simplify this to a model that is the bare minimum that will be adequate to survive the constraints we have. And we are more likely to survive if we have broad open strings and unconstrained fields that people put real lived experience information into than if we drive to an incredibly fine grained definition. And I kind of didn't like that. But I have come to realize that he is quite realistic. So I want to make some unhelpful observations. The primary reason this information is going to exist in information systems which EPP feeds and which RDAP provides is not so that they equal each other inside this closed ecology that we do here. This information exists so that it can be clicked on and feed a mail client or clicked on and drive a phone call or a fax or copy into some user's personal device. They're purposeful for another outside goal. And I am starting to worry that saying they will be defined in this room is unrealistic behavior. And that possibly we need to actually say, you know, eventually JMAP will finish. And there will be definitions of cards and contacts and structured information that we will be able to use. But if we've defined some narrow contextual behavior in here, we will not align. And that worries me. And it's not to say there isn't a real problem here, because there is. And EPP cannot just ignore this. And so we'll have to ultimately handle representations. But I personally now believe they're not there because EPP needs them. They're there because real people need them. And ultimately, it's driving to my phone. And whatever Google decides is the representation of addressing information in my handset will strongly inform how I react. So if I may, I think my takeaway from that, just to make sure I understand, is... Said, said right, because I probably missaid it, but I'll love to hear what you got, Jim. Um, to... Think of these things independently and let them move forward on, on their own path. So don't try to make this decision now. Yeah, that's where I was heading. Don't try and constrain it now because we're doomed and we're going to create a collision in other standard spaces where real contact info is defined. And I actually suspect Mario is working in those other spaces. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's keep the queue moving. Uh, Gavin, you're up next. Thank you. Yes. Hey, so um, just for the record, I'm a co-author on Mario's draft. 
Um, and to a certain extent, all of this is my fault anyway, because I was the first person to say out loud that J card sucks and we should change it. Um, but that, that's kind of my point is that the reason why we're having this discussion in the first place is because when we were out there implementing our dev, we found J card was where things broke most easily and most quickly, whether you're on the client side or on the server side. And in my, with, with my new hat on in, in ICANN, that's where I see the most problems with registrar and registry RDAP servers. It's in, in, inside the J card object. And so the objective was to come up with something that was empirically simpler to implement so that we had better, better, you know, better compliance with standards, better um, uh, uh, you know, ergonomics for developers. Um, and I think that should be, if we, if, if we have a binary choice between simple contact and JS contact or J card or whatever, we should be, it should be an, a fairly empirical thing. Which one is simpler to implement if you're developing a client or a server? Um, so that's my my input on this question. Okay, thank you. Um, I've locked the queue at this point, but we're gonna run the queue here, but give everyone a chance to speak. Scott, you're up next. Uh, thank you, Scott Hollenbeck. Uh, as an implementer, I like the idea of there being one standard way of doing something, right? And given that we've got JCard in RFC 9083 as a proposed standard today, once you've implemented it, no matter how painful it is or was, it's done. And once you get it working, it works, right? So if we want to talk about alternative or you know, different formats for that, I like the idea of these new formats being published as experimental standards, and then you know, get them out there, let the market decide if these are easier to implement, more useful to use, and at some point then, if it looks like one of these is gaining traction, we could talk about deprecating, you know, this part of 9083 or replacing it with a new standard. Okay, thank you. I saw Gavin nodding his head. I wanted to make sure it was to that too. So going down the experimental path with sort of something you would agree with? So, yeah, to, to go back to my point about it, sh it should be an empirical thing that we can, we can make a judgment on. If we make them both experimental, and then see how the, the marketplace of implementation treats each one. I mean, it's going to be a nightmare because for us in the, in the, in the ICANN world, we're going to be trying to monitor, monitor you know, a whole plethora of different RDAP implementations, but maybe that's the only way we can get that number or that, that measurement if we can't come to a consensus in the group that there's an objective benefit to one versus the other. Okay, thank you. Mary, you're up. Andy on deck. Uh, do you have any commitment to implement the second thing yet from anybody? It, except... By second thing, do you mean JS contact? Sorry, yes, JS, JS contact. Uh, only Mario's already doing that, so yes, he's one. Yeah, one. How are you going to do interoperability testing with one? Just, just things to think about. You don't have to. Oh, I'm not trying to torpedo the idea. I'm just like make sure that that's in there. Yeah. So you. Gavin's raising his hand to indicate they're doing an implementation too. Two? So there'll be no. at least. Oh, old hat. Old hat. Right. Oh, oh. So Central Nick was doing it. Okay. Okay. And the other, just other, one other quick point. I agree that it's weird to put. JSON in XML, but it shouldn't stop you. It's, that's the systems, the software can handle it. Okay. Thank you, Murray. Uh, Andy, and then uh, Jim Gould on deck. So um, is your proposal that both of them go experimental? I, I would say that the, uh, yes, that, well, no. What I want to say is they should not go on standard track, I think. From an IETF process point of view, standard track is not the right answer. Informational is also an option, but I think experimental is better. That's not really a proposal. That's an observation. But both of them, not one or the other. Right. Okay. Both of them. Um, all right. So, so I spoke to Tom, who's the, the co-author on Simple Contact, and we're good with that. Uh, the, um, but yeah, so, so we're good with that. If that's if both of them are go, going to go down that path, um, I do want to comment on something that George said. Uh, the so my journey down this path was uh, as a JS contact uh, cheerleader, and then I had to implement it, and I decided that I would rather have my you know go to the dentist or something like that instead. The uh, anyone who's not seriously looked at it needs to seriously look at it. It's got some some uh, pretty big things in there that we don't want. You don't want people putting photographs, or you don't want people giving their anniversary, things like that that are completely irrelevant uh, to what we need to do here. Um, uh, so so I, I would, you know, if you haven't looked at JS Contact, you need to, because it has no relevancy to what we do here in, in the regex working group, the parts of it, sorry. The, 
the question about EPP and EPP's contact model, and I'm sure James Gould is behind me somewhere about to talk about this. I think that's a separate issue and we should not, we should address that in the EPP, in an EPP discussion and EPP discussion only. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't mix that with the RDAP stuff. If we end up in, you know, five years or whatever, doing something in EPP with a contact model that needs to change in RDAP, then we'll just do another RDAP extension. Uh, but we can't, we can't, I think trying to marry those two things at the moment is just, uh, it's just asking for a lot of endless discussions that it's just not going to go anywhere. Um, but to your third point about should we consider allowing both to negotiate a selection? Um, I believe EPP party can, but uh, the RDAPX draft is all about RDAP being able to negotiate uh, capabilities. So. Yep. Thank you for that. And Jim Gould, you're up next. And uh, yep, I'm sure he's going to say exactly what you're saying about EPP. Yeah, Jim Gould, uh, Verisign. Uh, yeah, I was going to kind of mirror what you say that I don't see like EPP being in this equation. Uh, it should be between the two representations. Um, but I actually thought when I was posting on the list related to being simple, I actually thought that the extension would be just kind of a JSON representation of the, the RC5733. Uh, but the reality is that I was being a little bit myopic here because the address registries have to be considered as well as CCTLDs. So my concern is that a simplified extension will just get more complex as we bring in all these additional uh, requirements. So I really don't have an opinion though on the you know, experimental versus uh, informational, but uh, I just want to bring up. Okay, thank you for the additional questions. Um, Werner, you're up next, Richard on deck. Winners now from Core Association. Um, we've started standardizing what comes out of a registry. When the, in the past, we standardized what went into um, the, a registry. And it, it is actually probably a smarter way to go about standardization because there's many ways things go into um, a registry. And from my, my own registry management experience, I see that much of what's in the registry does not come from EPP, maybe not in terms of number of bytes, a big, a big chunk, but in terms of significance, a very big um, element might actually not have come in, in the, um, through, through EPP, such as you know, the stuff that nowadays we're looking at, whether something has been verified. You know, you know, that's, of course, cannot always just be done by um, the EPP itself. And uh, if you look at the current um, J contact, you don't even actually get the, the minimal things out of it, for instance, into in the international and localized um, contacts, we just get one of them. We, we, we don't have the, the other one. So I think it's a, we, we should use it as a, as a way to say, yes, indeed, it's what comes out of it. And that should be, you know, the, the, the choice of the protocols of how we evolve it. It's, it's a good standard also to feed bulk data from one system to, an, uh, to another, not just for, um, access by third parties and in in that respect probably the the, the logic of making it a little bit simpler and covering the, the the stuff they already have is a is 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 a good is a good one so just quickly my takeaway from that um is uh that you would be supportive if these things were to come forward and go into experimental because i also happen to think you've asked a lot of really good questions and good observations and it gives us an opportunity to talk about that and those issues and go forward with that. So, okay, and you're nodding your head, so that's good. Uh, Rick, you're up next, and then Mario, you're last in the queue. So, Rick. Thanks, I'm Rick Wilhelm, PIR. Um, in general, supportive of both going experimental, agree that we don't want to do one and not the other, and having three in the standards world would be sort of bananas. Um, I, uh, at, at PIR, we probably won't implement one of these things. Um, this is not where I would stick my next, you know, X thousands of dollars in investment um, in, in this sort of thing, uh, maybe in a future research project. But once, once this sort of stuff is sort of like Hollenbeck said, once this is working, it tends to be relatively stable. So we probably wouldn't be implementing one of these things unless something came along that sort of merited that. But in, in future and in current um, thing what once we've got it working it's pretty stable and it works uh, even though it's kind of a pain to get it working at the beginning thank you okay thank you uh mario uh you get the last word here and we are actually now we have made up the time 
that we were at before. So we're right at the end of our session. So please uh, be brief, but go ahead. Uh, I started by saying that uh, I'm not uh, much in favor of having two different uh, or three different contact representation. Uh, and in choosing what is the best uh, solution, I think that uh, we must consider what is the, the more efficient, the most efficient, uh, not the more com complex, the most complex or the most, uh, or, or the easiest, because uh, uh, co complexity is, is a very subject, subjective. So, um, Another point to consider is that, for example, talking about efficiency, uh, we should wonder if it, it, it is more efficient to have uh, uh, language-dependent information to replicating, replicated multiple times instead of having uh, a single point uh, in the representation where you can represent all the localization, no matter if they are related to a predefined, f f predefined field or, or an extension. Uh, again, in terms of choosing between uh, maps or arrays, we should uh, think about what is better from the point of view of reducting uh, an item in a collection, if it's better to reduct, uh, if we to reduct uh, a, a map entry or uh, an array item. Uh, I conclude uh, saying that uh, we are uh, going towards uh, a world where we are requested, uh, we are required to. Uh, represent the information as accurate as possible because there are regulation like for example NIS2 in Europe to detail the information not to have the information unstructured or uh, so uh, this is the point I think that we have to think about uh, a solution that is uh, flexible, extensible, and uh, efficient. Okay, thank you, Mario. Um, my takeaway in all of this is I, I don't think I heard anyone object to both of them going experimental if we get that far, um, but I've also clearly heard a lot of interesting questions, uh, observations, so there's some quite some discussion to be had on the mailing list about uh, really how we go forward with these two documents, what they look like. So we'll get into the details of that on the mailing list. We are now um, five minutes over our time moving along, but uh, let's move on to the next section here, new work with presentations and Mario, I'm, I'm sorry, Antoine, back over to you. Okay, so we go to new work or at least not adopted your work yet. And first one up is Scott, so Scott, go ahead. Uh, thanks Antoine, let's skip through this really quickly here. Um, so yeah, draft written prior to 117. Uh, the idea is to describe an operational scenario that we have seen in the wild, where a registrars who are doing some things that is somewhat counter to guidance in RFCs 57, 31, and 32 about deleting host and domain objects have created a hijacking risk. So um, Bill Carroll and I wrote this draft initially. We've since bought on Gadamadawake as a co-author to describe what we thought were current practices, some suggestions on best practices, right? Um, and ultimately, we'd like to be able to document what we think the best practices are with community consensus. Next slide, please. Uh, so that, I already covered the problem there a little bit. Next slide, please. Uh, big change from zero, zero to zero, one. In zero, zero, we actually try to describe some of these practices as best. We've backed off from that. Zero one simply lists all the practices that we're aware of that either exist now or that we think might exist. And there's a big TBD in the place where it says, and these are what we think the best practices are, which leads us unfortunately to, next slide please, we need your help because best practices in an ITF context are a matter of community consensus. 
And so we're really looking for some input or for some input. And since we published all one, there has been not even crickets. I mean, absolute silence. And so we're you know, looking for some guidance here, some feedback folks. Please take a look at how we have described the existing practices. In some cases, we have tried to describe what we think are benefits and detriments you know, to both, but those are all currently a matter of co-editor opinion. We might have gotten something wrong. You might disagree with us. We'd like to know. And then if we've missed any practices that might be possible, let's hear about those. And then I'd really like to have your thoughts on what you think those best practices are, right? There's two elements here, right? There's an EPP side to this. And we recognize that there are probably some things we can do a little bit differently in EPP, but there is a DNS, DNS op angle here as well. Because remember, EPP is just an input here. Ultimately, operators have to publish zones that deal with things like NS records, glue records, and delegation information. What kinds of things might we do to make that more resistant to the type of hijacking that's described in the draft? All right. Help, please. Okay, so thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, I put myself in the queue first. Um, so the, the current draft is is called deletions, or it focuses mostly on deletions. Um, I'm very glad that you will have uh, a presentation in the uh, software working group because I think you will be you will have much support there. Um, from my point of view, would it be possible to also uh, change like the creation of host object if that would be um, a best current practice for object for host objects? Absolutely. If people think there's something we can do differently about the creation of these objects to prevent the problem in the future, I think that's in scope. Okay, thank you. The next up is Andy, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I think the best thing to do is to fix EPP. Uh, that would be the best thing to do. That is uh, easy for me to say at the microphone and hard for people to do when they get back to the office. So uh, I think the second best thing to do, and I put this on the mailing list and heard crickets from DNS land, uh, is to suggest that people use a .invalid domain name. Um, that uh, may require a little bit of implementation, but it is just changing your current, I created a, a name out of thin air to something I created .invalid. Right. So it's a pretty easy fix. Right, and now for what it's worth, there is currently a description of a practice about a sacrificial name servable using some kind of, oh, sorry, a sacrificial TLD. Unfortunately, it does not currently mention dot invalid. Um, we need to change that. Okay. No. Right. Okay. Hi, uh, I can't quite do Jim Reed's voice, so I'll use my own DNS oh, directorate. I thought Jim Reed is here. He's right there. Um, <laughs> I think that, I think this is in the right place, but I would bring up, bring the DNS directorate in early. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. And we move on to the next one. So, Gavin, you're up next. If you want to come to the mic while we're getting the slides loaded. Yeah, I have to the shape back, right? Hello again. So, um, I'm here as a harbinger from another place, um, just to bring Indeed. to your attention, to the attention of this working group, some uh, developments happening in the ICANN world that may have implications for uh, this working group. Um, and let's wait for the slide to come up. Not the TTL, scroll down. Here we're going. That one, yeah. So um, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so. There is in the ICANN world um, an expedited policy development process, which means it's taken three years so far to get to <laughs> publishing its uh, final report. Um, uh, and, and this obviously is focusing on the issue of internationalized domain names, specifically uh, variant TLDs. So that's uh, two TLDs in the root zone that are some have some, some semantic relationship um, in, in something at some language other than, than written in la uh, Latin. Um, and also how variants at the second level might be created and managed together. Um, and um, although the, 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 the phase one final report has just been published, it's primarily uh, concerned with variants at the top level. Uh, second phase is going to look at variants at the second level. And that means it's going to have implications on provisioning because it will have 
uh, considerations and requirements for things like creation of uh, groups of names as a kind of atomic bundle or, or the creation of a primary name and then selective act activation of, of, of variants that have to be managed in the same way as that primary name. Um, the, uh, the policy recommendations, yeah, are going to have this impact, impact on provisioning. Um, and there's obviously a risk um, you know, if, if we're not on, across these, um, these developments, um, there'll be a, a risk that, that as these recommendations get Get kind of go through the ICANN process and they become policy, then registry operators are going to be required to start implementing them. And without standard available for them to pull off the shelf and use, they'll do their own thing. And registrars will just kind of go, oh, too much work and go, and nothing will happen. So um, uh, the, uh, there's a link there to the, to the EPDP so you can, um, can see what's going on. So next slide, please. So as I say, the phase two, um, uh, has, has only just begun, phase one's only just finished. So there is um, uh, no, no, no wording for us to, 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 to base any work on. Uh, and obviously it's hard to do engineering when there are no requirements, but um, you know, it's worth starting to think about this process. Um, so yeah, there's gonna be some issues about how you solve uh, some of these requirements about, for example, the same registrant rule. Now, um, how do you do that in a TLD that doesn't have any contact data because it's a thin registry? Um, Know, what can you do? Can you do you just say it has to be the same registrar, or do you have to do you have something that that, that allows you as a registry to, to 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 get assurance from the registrar that they are allocating that variant to the same person as the as the registrant of the primary name? Um, do we uh, again um, activate a variant by creating a new object, which might involve a, a, a new object and that's a, um, a ROID that has a ROID that needs to be provisioned in database that might appear in a data escrow deposit that might need to have an RDAP record, or is it merely an attribute or some, some kind of um, additional uh, subordinate value of, a, of, of an existing object? Um, if you're uh, receiving a, a request to, to activate a variant, how do you know what the primary label is if all you're getting is a create command with a, with a name in the name element and nothing else. So these are things where EPP is going to need to be extended in order to give that information to the registry to make sure that everything is being done properly. Um, and also there's no way to know uh, which LGR to use to, to validate whether that, um, that label is correct because it might be that there's a label that's valid in multiple LGRs that might all have different variant rules. And so it might be a valid variant in one, but not a valid variant in the other. And so you, you need to make sure that you're, 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 you've got that information ahead of you. And as I said before, it, this could result in extensions to, to RDAP. It could result in new object mappings to go into data escrow. Um, so there could be a kind of exploding um, effect where you know, change to EPP results in changes to RDAP and changes to data escrow and so on. Next slide. So we don't want there to be a waterfall uh, here where you know the, the EPDP goes off and does its thing and comes up with recommendations and then that gets turned into some sort of policy that has to be implemented and then it comes to the engineers and they say well we can't do any of this uh, without a multi-year standards development effort or everyone doing their own thing and again registrars looking at this and saying do i want to try and offer these newfangled variant names this looks like a lot of work <clears throat> no go back to doing what i was doing before with just ascii so um, we need to start that dialogue um, and um, we need to bring the engineers in to say look this is the sort of thing that that, that is possible is feasible this is harder this is easier um, and people are going to start putting pen to paper soon, so they need that feedback earlier rather than later. So uh, next slide, please. So this is how to give that feedback. So if you work for a registry, a registrar, or for a CCTLD registry, um, you will have potentially inside your organization someone working in the GNSO, working in the CCNSO, um, who may be able to bring feedback to the PDP. Um, if you, um, you know, if you have something that's valid and relevant, um, the CPH Tech Ops Group, which is the, the contracted parties, so registries and registrars, um, have a Tech Ops forum where they talk about these issues. So again, you can come to that forum and bring your your input. Uh, the Regex mailing list could also be used for this, um, and one also, uh, you know, it would be great if there was something off the shelf. You know, something that started out in the CCTLD world that we could bring to the GTLD world and say, look, this works really well here. Why not take that and bring it into the GTLD world? It can be the basis of the standard that we then use everywhere else. 
Um, and if you're wanting to follow the, the work of the PDP, uh, there's a mailing list, there's a wiki. Um, it's, you know, it, the, the, uh, the GNSO does its work more or less in the open. So um, it's time to, uh, uh, there's no way, no barriers to getting involved. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So um, we have a queue. We close the queue because of time. Uh, first up is uh, Jim. Thank you. So just a, one quick chair's comment, and then I'll make a comment for myself. Um, and that is a reminder, although, you know, Gavin talked a lot about stuff going on in ICANN, and I know there's a lot of sensitivity to whether or not we're doing ICANN's work for it. But I want to emphasize that this is an engineering question and a technical question, and we're here to solve the technical problem. And then speaking for myself, um, I will observe that I am one of uh, a small set. There's a small set of select registries and registrars. We've actually been getting together and spending a lot of time thinking about what it means to implement where policy thinks it's going. Um, and I just want to support Gavin. There's some real questions here and some real issues. We're, we're headed down a path. We're, we're feeling good about our path, but there's still a lot to be known. So I appreciate that Gavin bringing all this to the attention here. And people should start thinking about it and raise questions on the mailing list um, or and or, you know, feel free to reach out to me and uh, we can talk more about what's going on and, and what people are doing and very interested in additional input about what it means to, to do some of these things. So thanks. Okay, Richard, and next. Yep, uh, Rick Will on PIR. Um, yes, and to what Jim said um, in no disagreement to what uh, Gavin is saying, um, we the the thing that I would this is probably the best plug for CPH Tech Ops that uh, anybody not named Jothan has given in quite a while. So kudos to you for that. Uh, anybody that can out talk Jothan is is um you know that's quite a quite a thing. When he sees the transcript, he's really going to laugh. Um, not unlike Andy. Uh, so so yeah, that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, the other thing I would offer this something to to one. Um, a number of these problems that Gavin has identified, we are making good headway on. So it's it's not maybe quite as dire as, as Gavin's slides might make you to indicate if a, if a less forgiving reading of them is applied. Um, to um, uh, uh, Jim and I and some others who aren't in the room um, but might be listening to the recording um, are making, we're, we're also giving feedback into the policy folks to make sure that they don't do things that are unimplementable, right? So um, it is actually a little bit maybe better than we might be afraid of uh, in that we're making sure that they don't do what we would, what we techies would say are stupid things, TM, <laughs> capital S, capital T. So uh, we, we tend to try and help prevent that too. But yeah, there is a good reason uh, CCTLD people, you can be thankful that you're not ICANN people, but GTLD people should take time to get involved. Thank you. I, th I think I heard Rick, that you, you will take any and all feedback, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm next in the queue. Um, I actually want to stress, you know, we, we do EPP and RNAP not only for GTLDs and not only for CCTLDs. Um, we also still have RERs. Uh, EPP is supposed to be, you know, extensible provisioning protocols for all registries. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point you to is something that we already did in 2007 for enum registries. Well, we actually had the same issue that the um, the owner of a zone file had to represent the number owner in the E6163 uh, uh, space. So w the way I see it, that this is a validation of policy, not so much as a technical variant. Um, so you might want to have to, uh, want to have a look at uh, RFC 5076, which is actually looking at this. You know how how can you actually signal this validation of policy towards a register create or an update command or whatever. So that's just some recommendation for me. And then we have Jim Reed. Jim Reed. I'm um, sorry we don't have more gyms in this working group. Uh, I just want to say this thing, Gavin, but it might be a no-op. Um, I was involved in the ICANN ARSREC committee thing that reviewed that TLD internationalized domain thing, and that was several years ago. I've completely forgotten all about it and what we discussed. Paul Hoffman was the guy that chaired that little group that did the work, but it might be there might be some useful information from that that could be incorporated into the discussions that are taking place at ICANN. 
or of course it could be complete nonsense. Okay, obviously uh, all the discussions are happening in the community, and I'm 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 acting as a as a as a channel. So yeah. so uh, um, there's not I'm not actively working on this. I'm I'm here as a uh, as a as a as like I say as a messenger. Okay. Um, but but you know if there is like as I said if there's prior art like the Enum thing like the thing yeah. you just mentioned that, yeah. that Paul knows about then you know, we can take that. I'll talk to Paul. Um, but we can take that to that community that's doing that work in that PDP. Okay. I don't think we got as far as talking about anything to do with UPP extensions or anything like that, but it's worth having a check just in case. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And back to Gavin. Thank you. And we move up to the <laughs> next presentation. It's going to be JSIP. Yes, JSDIP on GeoFeeds. Let me get across slides. Go ahead. Hey, uh, firstly, I think my name was spelled Sings, but I'm not going to sing with S I N G. Uh, but anyway, uh, no big deal. So, a bit of a change of a subject. Hi, I'm just deep. Um, this presentation is about uh, request for adoption and RDAP extension for geofeed data. So, it's a, it's a, and uh, Tom Harrison from APNIC and myself will be working on it. Next slide, please. So uh, some background, uh, why this was created. There are a couple of RFCs, uh, 8805 and 9092, and it's uh, update uh, internet draft. They detail the IP geolocation feed uh, concept. Uh, but at core, what the concept is generally, it's an IP address and location information, and you have multiple lines for it in files. Um, and and but the benefits of it is that essentially uh, it helps reduces network latency between enterprise networks and internet service providers because uh, uh, internet service providers publish their points of presence and so do enterprise networks thank google for a minute and and then they kind of discover each other and say let me bring my services uh, in the physical distance on the internet closer to each other uh, and, and so that's one of the benefits and the second is uh, it localizes internet services by region. Uh, and, and, uh, but that said, uh, RFC 9092 is about finding and using the geofeed data. And uh, lo and behold, they're talking about uh, using directory services. So one approach was uh, uh, IRR based, but the second one, they also dropped a hint at using RDAP because RDAP is the premier directory service right now. Uh, where uh, you can access geofeed data, their recommendation was use the remarks field. Remarks field, as you know, is a comments field uh, where uh, it is not structured because it's multiple lines. And uh, the proposal we are bringing, it's a rather a brief proposal, is that we want to define a new RDAP extension for geofeed data to afford a purposed RDAP field instead. So instead of remarks field, have a definitive uh, data structure for it, hence the need for an extension. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what is the proposal? <coughs> Essentially, uh, uh, it extends the IP network object class to include a new GeoFeed member. Um, and the, I, I give a, a lighted example here. Uh, the extension is GeoFeed V1. Uh, and the member for now, it essentially is, uh, for the recommendations of RFC 9092 folks, uh, a simple HTTPS URL, which points to the GeoFeed file uh, for that uh, network. And, and uh, uh, lastly, uh, there are certain cautions around uh, privacy and security considerations. Uh, privacy, thou shall not publish inadvertently somebody's, uh, an individual's location. And the security is uh, at core is HTTPS URL for a start. And secondly, uh, not sure how familiar we are here, but in the uh, file itself, they also have optionally the RPKI uh, signing concept. Uh, and, and because it rhymes very well with the RAR side of uh, IP addresses and the tree. Uh, so this is a proposal. Uh, and for now, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a single member. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so request for adoption, 
in an out-of-band way, we have uh, shown this uh, proposal to the RFC 902 authors. They support it. Um, and and uh, uh, secondly, what we are finding is that the RAR communities, uh, uh, which includes ISPs and enterprises, they're asking for it, uh, whether it is uh, Erin, APNIC, uh, I know for sure, and then uh, uh, RIPE. In fact, RIPE went all the way where the RIPE community has actually made it one of the purposes for uh, uh, that RAR that you will allow uh, uh, geofeed data. Uh, so, uh, so the request here is that uh, to help standardize this geofeed data access through RDEP, uh, uh, we, we wanted to sort of bring it to the group. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Jasdeep. We have questions in the queue. Scott. Uh, Scott Hollenbeck, not a question. I support this. If we can work this in using our standard, standard working group document adoption processes, let's do this. Thank you. And then Gavin, next. Uh, this is Gavin Brown, um, I can. Um, so the, the, the payload of the, uh, the extension is a URL. Um, so would it not be more kind of uh, RDAP like to use a link and to specify a link relation um, and say this is where you, is this, this, you know, there's a link for, the, for, for a record that has um, uh, a type of geofeed and, and an href of the URL rather than adding a URL as a, as a, a naked string in the, uh, in the RDAP object. That's an interesting take on this, but typically uh, when you're talking about links and somebody correct me, I'm looking at Andy. Uh, Generally, it's talking about different representations, uh, you know, uh, media types or uh, so. But here, the idea was it kind of becomes a part of the inherent uh, IP network object class. But that's an interesting point you raise. Uh, and the second idea was that for now, it's simple as simply an HTTPS URL string. But in the future, it could actually become a more sophisticated data structure. We don't know that. Uh, but that'll be another extension if that was the case. Okay. Just, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Just um, just wanted to make that comment, and I would say I'd support this as well. If it thank you. Working groups. Okay. That was the last one in the queue. Thank you, Jessip. Just uh, formally, you know, if you want to ask for adoption, send a message to the chairs, and we will uh, uh, ask for a formal <laughs> adoption request on the mailing list. I was going to say I support it, if only for the idea that using remarks to signal this is horrible. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. And let me, as an individual, just apologize to uh, Jazip for getting your name wrong on the chair slides. That's entirely on me. My apologies. Uh, that was a joke. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> OK, then next one up, Martin on RESTful interfaces. And let me get your slides up here. Restful transport. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, I would like to use my ten minutes here today to try to convince you that um, we might uh, need to look into uh, supporting a restful transport for EPP. Um, next slide, please. And um, so, why why should we spend our time on this? Uh, do we have a problem with EPP? Well. It, seems to work fine. There's a lot of adoption for EPP. A lot of registries are running EPP. And um, you know, the, the stated goal from the, the original RFCs, like 5730, that to create a standard protocol for uh, uh, domain provisioning, it's worked out pretty well. Uh, as I said, most of most, a lot of registries are using this. But uh, lately, uh, what at least what I'm seeing is that there are also registries that are starting to work on other types of uh, APIs, doing domain name provisioning and other domain related uh, uh, functionalities. And they're all based on a RESTful architecture. And uh, I, I created a, a small list uh, for above, uh, containing the registries that I know of that already have functional uh, APIs doing uh, RESTful uh, domain provisioning or are working on it. Uh, this is not a complete list, it's just, uh, I compiled it based on a quick question on the mailing list. Uh, uh, for instance, I, uh, the P 
people from DNEC uh, let me know that they're also actively looking into creating RESTful APIs for domain name provisioning. Um, so what, I, what I'm seeing here is that there might be a risk that the original goal for EPP, having a standardized interface for registries, uh, well, there might be a risk of, of fragmentation into multiple different incompatible APIs uh, if this continues. So there might be something here that we need to look at. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so why, why, why are registries doing this? Well, I think there are many reasons. Um, I, I, I tried to list, uh, uh, I think, the, the most common or uh, most important ones here. And, well, a lot of them also have to do in, in how, our, you know, our, uh, how we develop our applications in, in today's current more than mostly cloud environments. Uh, we run into issues uh, such as load balancing, for instance, uh, the, the layer three load balancing for EPP or TCP isn't, isn't always ideal. For instance, when you run microservices in the cloud or in, as in containers on-premise somewhere, it, it, if you are able to do or able to use HTTP and do layer, layer seven load balancing, you have way more advanced uh, options for, for traffic uh, management. Uh, rate limiting can also be, be an issue. Um, and also identity access management uh, also uh, will be a lot easier if you're just able to use the, the standard HTTP solutions that are out there already. Um, and also registrars. Well, developers working at registrars, they, they like to use APIs and they're used to working with APIs. And most APIs today are using REST, RESTful, uh, JSON, XML, doesn't really matter. And um, this simplifies development between uh, registry and registrar. And although it is not too difficult to develop a client based on TCP, REST is just a lot easier. And the, but what you see today is that REST is also like the de facto standard for API development. Uh, next, please. So um, we've looked into this before. I, I myself looked at, into this like 11 years ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. And uh, to maybe proposing something in this area of using REST and uh, including EPP commands uh, as REST payloads and uh, mapping commands to uh, REST endpoints. And there's also some more recent work uh, about uh, using HTTP transport and, and, and sending the XML as a payload for HTTP. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what, what am I proposing here? Uh, well, not a big surprise, as I mentioned. Uh, maybe we should consider creating a new standard for RESTful transport. And what, what this should or could contain is, uh, as I mentioned, the, a mapping for the normal domain and host objects to uh, uh, standard defined REST endpoints and maybe use uh, standard HTTP sessions and session management. Uh, for session management, uh, currently EPP, the standard EPP has the, the login and the logout. Um, but we, that isn't really a thing in, 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 in the HTTP layer. So maybe there's something there that isn't really compatible, but I think uh, it should should be able to, to work correctly if you just uh, spend a little time on it. And also an, an option would be into looking, uh, can we map the, the standard XML schemas we have today for EPP to a, a JSON format, although that would be a lot of work, and uh, but it is something we could consider and uh, look into the future as well. Um, I don't know that the standard for EPP describes uh, 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 EPP uh, pipelining and so, uh, something like that might become easier in the, in the future if we uh, all use <laughs> hopefully HTTP3 uh, quick and uh, with the support for streams and multiplexing and. Well, and last month, uh, there was a, a, a meeting with the, the Center Tech and R&D group in, in Paris. And the community that got together there, they, we discussed this. And it, it's turned out there is widespread support for something like this. Um, the common consensus there was that, that this would make things easier for registries and also for registrars. And there was uh, also support to help work on this. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, the main question I have, is this something we as a group should spend time on? Um, is this important enough? And if so, uh, are there any volunteers who would like to help join, 
participate. Uh, I think I'm, I, I would like to work on this. I, I think there are uh, more center members that would like to work on this. Uh, so I think uh, we can come up with a, with a group that has time to spend uh, on this. But I would really like to hear what the uh, people in this group have to uh, say about this. Uh, next slide. Oh yeah, that's it, thank you. So thank you, Martin. Uh, first one to comment, Werner. National Core Association, I really like, I very much support this because we've seen that the basis, just the way the transport is organized and the access is organized actually creates a couple of institutional weaknesses that uh, actually shouldn't be there anymore. To have a single password for an entire organization for millions of domain names is, is probably not a good idea. So we, we, we should evolve um, a little bit. And the, the path via RESTful uh, interface is probably the most strategic one because we can rely on other solutions that are already available. Yes, exactly. That the, 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 like the microservice uh, uh, HTTP environment that has very mature solutions for identity and access management already. So we could use that out of the box. Okay, thank you. Next, Scott. Uh, Scott Hollenbeck. Uh, as we all know, EPP was designed from the outset you know, to separate the data specification from the transport specification. So I do think this is work worth exploring, right? Uh, a word of caution, though. As soon as you start talking about JSON encoding, you are taking a step towards something that is potentially a much bigger can of worms. And every step you take, every move you make, <laughs> channeling that philosopher, Sting, not that I'm going to be watching you, but anyway, uh, we need to be careful. I think if we can scope this carefully, and I think a step towards focusing on the transport while leaving the XML as a first step would be a good one. Let's do that. And then let's see what happens, right? Because it's at some point, I think if, if we start talking about, you know, changing the encoding, we really are, as I said, inching a little bit closer towards that EPP 2.0 discussion. Uh, and and we've, we've, we've talked about that a little bit before in the past, and everyone seems to look at that abyss and then back away. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with you. As I, I also, in the slide, I mentioned it as optionally because it's a totally different beast. And uh, I think a first good step would be to maybe add the support for REST and then look at additional uh, formats. Thank you, Nick. What's up, Paolo? Yes, Paolo um, again. <clears throat> so um, I wanted to mention just one additional motivation for the registries with, for, for doing it. So, so basically the, the registries are usually offering some additional uh, registry related services towards the, the uh, registrars and uh, by using the RESTful APIs for this. So basically unifying this, this plane for access management perspective and for, for transport uh, perspective is, is something useful. And this is why uh, also this uh, kind of approach finds uh, adoption also for domain provisioning use cases. Um, so I, I think this uh, important work and uh, this group should support it in my opinion, uh, because the, the very, very valuable input, let's say outside of this group, but uh, I don't know already mentioned, uh, but could be useful to, to make it, uh, make it right. Uh, and uh, to the point from Scott about EPP 2.0, whether we should start the discussion. Well, it seems that from this list uh, that the EPP 2.0 is already kind of happening. So uh, we may find out that we have multiple EPP 2.0s in a few years. So uh, taking into account the life cycle of such uh, endeavor, uh, probably it is the right time to think, uh, to not to, um, let's say, procrastinate this discussion. Pavel, do you have anything to comment? Um, no, I, I agree with Pavel that things are happening and it is important that if you all know things take a long time in the ITF and so we run the risk that registries um, don't, are not going to wait for developments here and that we are getting confronted with de facto standards that are already being developed out, outside of the ITF and well, 
that 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 is something which you need to look in, look into as well. Yes. I do want to point out we still have a few number a few people in the queue, but the queue has already closed because we are running out of time. Uh, we have still four people in the queue before we closed it. Christian, you're next. Yes. Uh, first, Martin, uh, very useful information. I couldn't agree more with uh, with Scott. So uh, probably we should split up into the transport part and the uh, data part. Um, just looked up the number because uh, we supporting a simple key value format for our registry system, and it's the take up is about 60% key value against uh, the XML part. So maybe it's worse, but it's a different topic. So um, from the restful part from my uh, talks to, to others, um, I see that especially new registrars are very keen in picking up restful environments instead of the, the old EPP environments. So yeah, please go on with it. Yeah, of course, makes sense that the existing registrars are already uh, invested in integrating uh, with registries. Uh, but at some point, they also need to think about updating their systems. And yeah, so the migration part is something we also should uh, maybe consider. Okay, next one, Nathan. Yes, Nathan from Jurid. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the presentation. I think uh, I support all what you said. I think one of the benefits of uh, working on a RESTful API is the very large and growing ecosystem that uh, there is on REST. So I think that's one more reason to work on this. So to reply to you to two questions, yes, we should work on it. And uh, Jurid will be uh, very happy to uh, be involved and support this. Oh, great. Nice to hear. Yeah, and I think um, it, this will, maybe this is just my guess, but having a, like a RESTful transport could make it easier for smaller registrars to also integrate with, with automated systems from a registry because the, the tactical exp expertise you would need for EPP over TCP is quite a bit higher than just uh, implementing a RESTful API. Okay, and the last one is James Gould. Yeah, Jim Gould from VeriSign. Um, I'm supportive of this work. I mirror uh, Scott's feedback, and I'm very impressed that Scott still, still has hair um, after creating EPP. Big project uh, to do. But I would focus on the transports first, then look at the view without modifying the, the data model, and yeah. then potentially consider data. Yeah, OK, thank you. And with that, I'd like to thank Martin for his presentation. Um, we had two extra presentations from Andy. Sorry, Andy, we ran out of time. We knew this. Um, we were already uh, two minutes late, um, which reminds me that for next meeting, people, if you have topics for the next time, give them to us in time so we can ask for a, uh, a wider slot in the next meeting. I think we will go to a two-hour uh, slot uh, next, uh, next time. Um, that's, with that, I'd like to also thank Rick Wilhelm for taking some notes. Uh, and for everybody being present here, I think it was a very good productive meeting and um, we'll talk to each other on the mailing list. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.